Um, but Haiti, let me just tell you that I solemnly, I solemnly swear to try and include Shakira in one of my next papers. <laughs> so, <laughs> good morning. Uh, and I'd like to take a moment to thank the intimate team for this wonderful conference and for inviting me to be here. Well, this is far from the first time I've spoken at a conference, especially when the topic is uh, polyamory. But I'd like to share with you that this is the first time I'll be delivering a keynote. The reason I'm mentioning this is simple. The symbolism and effective way of doing something for the first time is what spurred me to do more visibly something which I feel is of the utmost importance. Ever since the Intimate team sent me the invite to become a consultant for the project, I knew that it involved being here with you today. And so I wanted to use this opportunity even though I wasn't particularly clear on just how I would do that. As I have argued elsewhere, studies around polyamory and other forms of consensual non-monogamies have been focused in trying to understand contemporary changes in intimacies and sexualities around the globe, and the international nature of this research project and of this conference is proof enough of that. At the same time, though, I feel that not a lot of attention has been paid to the producing and archiving of situated knowledges, to the situatedness of how, for instance, polyamory and other forms of non-monogamy are conceived of in Portugal and how it differs or not from how it is conceived in Spain, in Germany, in the UK, etc., and how activists or more socially oriented groups appear, develop, or split off. More so, and I think Alessia sort of touched on this, so it's, uh, there's a lot of a narrative of the micro-personal, there's not a lot of uh, political and historical connections. More so, issues around the interpersonal and intimate interactions within these groups and how they impact on the groups, on what the groups do and say, how people gain access to these groups and so on, seems even more absent. Now, I admit that I might simply be demonstrating my own ignorance of the state of the art, and I'm also not trying to find a hole in the literature that I will then close up with whatever knowledge I might have produced. Rather, I think that the importance of the personal and the interpersonal level of specific alliances and also tensions is something that I realized bit by bit through my own engagement as an activist in issues around polyamory, LGBTQIA+, and feminism. With that goal in mind, I set out to do the most, two most obvious things you can imagine. I went to con through the archives of how the activist group Poly Portugal came to be, and I went to talk to some of the people who were there from the start. So this work that I'm mentioning now is still ongoing, and for now it represents just a reading of the first uh, two years of Poly Portugal's mailing list, and only three interviews for the moment. Now, as I've mentioned, I'm also an activist, and I have dedicated a lot of my own time and energy to Poly Portugal over the years. What this means is that some of the narratives of some of the people I've interviewed end up involving me. Sometimes in ways that made me feel happy, and sometimes in ways that were critical of things that I have done and that I have said. So this was a, a strange and sometimes uncomfortable, but always very enriching experience. You know, to be there, to hear this criticism, and as a researcher, to probe and to question deeper rather than trying to argue or to concede any point that was being made. In those moments, I became very self-conscious. I wasn't talking about Foucault. I wasn't talking about Foucault. So in those moments, I became very self-conscious about what I was feeling, how I was reacting emotionally and physically. Thinking about my own emotional experience resonated with a multitude of emotional experiences I had as I fulfilled different roles as a polyactivist. And so this in turn made me realize just how much my interviewees mentioned what they were feeling and how they connected those emotions and effects to their own stories of doing activism with Poly Portugal. So then the how of my approach to the topic became apparent. Yes, I wanted to bring into relief the importance of situated interpersonal relationships within activism, but that's too broad a goal, it's too fuzzy a concept. Effect, emotions, feelings. That became the angle through which I wanted to look at the material while attempting to give a somewhat chronological account of you know, the past few years. <coughs> 
You might have noticed that I'm using feelings, emotions, and effects rather interchangeably. My justification for, for that comes from the fact that my greatest influence in preparing this keynote was Sarah Ahmed's The Cultural Politics of Emotion. Uh, so, more Shakira and more Ahmed? Is that yes, okay for you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> There's no focus on this paper. Um, <laughs> she resists creating clear-cut distinctions between different levels of, or types of sentiments as these taxonomies of emotions are in themselves already positing some form of ontological knowledge over and about emotions. And so I also want to put aside this multiplication of terminology. This approach to my data also lends itself to some interesting wordplays, which I think actually illuminates some important connections. The title of this keynote, as you can see there, the, the political is personal, comes from asking what would happen if we took the famous feminist adage, the personal is political, and reversed its terms. If this adage is used to signify that issues kept in the private sphere need to be brought out, then looking at the role of emotions in protests or group hierarchies and so on seems to do exactly that. So why do I and did I revert the terms? When I say that the political is personal, I want to think about how the political being in the world and acting in the world is seen through a personal perspective. How it is bound up with the effects and emotions that create, as Sarah Ahmed puts it, the very effect of the surfaces and boundaries that allow us to distinguish an inside and an outside in the first place. And so I think this goes along with what Pihita was saying, you know, emotions and effects are part of the ways in which we create an us and a them in the first place. The other word, uh, word play or conceptual pun that I want to make is that by studying polyamory and other consensual non-monogamies, we are studying intimacies. Thus, to study the effects of people engaging in activism around polyamory is to study the intimacies around the performance of intimacy. To be sure, I'm not implying that there is a direct or causal relationship between how we live our amorous lives and how we act as activists. The challenge is to think how all of these intimacies form multiple layers which in turn co-constitute each other. It is through this idea of co-constitution that I want to return to Sarah Ahmed and to how different approaches and theories, the notion of the queer archive and the notion of the effective turn, can indeed be connected. She says that an archive is an effect of multiple forms of content. This means that any archive that I might here present is dependent on whatever contacts I have made with people whose effects already are part of their accounts of what and how they relate to their experiences. Likewise, and I want to make this very clear, what follows here is my own interpretation, so my own effective interpretation of the interviews and the archived material. It doesn't uh, intend to be the truth about what people were saying and doing at the time, but an effective <coughs> interpretation of that. I'll only have time to talk about the first two years of polyactivism in Portugal. And so PolyPortugal was created in September uh, 26, 2004 as a mailing list on Yahoo groups. Uh, but even though this was the first mailing list and the aggregation point of what came afterwards, it was actually not the first moment of activism around polyamory in Portugal. Less than a month after the mailing list's foundation, the founder speaks of another website created by someone called Lara, which was probably the first one in Portugal dedicated to polyamory specifically. But it wasn't until December 14, 2005, that another important person made her presence known. Monica joined the mailing list and shared her resolve to become more, quote, active and activist, unquote, following a newspaper article on Guardian and the 2005 International Polyamory Conference in Hamburg as well. And she also shared her own blog where she talked about several things like uh, uh, fight against um, uh, racist and, and xenophobic discourse, uh, the defense of migrants and so on, and she included non-monogamy as part of that uh, struggle against uh, oppression and discrimination. And so this sort of can be considered uh, to mark a, a transition between a zero moment in organized polyamory activism to a phase of consolidation. About as many emails were exchanged during the first year of the mailing list as during the two weeks after Monica joined the list. And before this moment, there was uh, basically mostly Lara's uh, website and Monica's blog and a few initiatives from, from Lara and from Monica to hold informal meetings in Lisbon and in Porto. It is here that I would like to detain myself 
And look at this commitment by Monica to be more, quote, active and activist. When I asked her about the context where she was coming from and its importance, she said that she was, quote, still very fascinated with the lesbian and trans scene with a lot of connections to self-organized, non-hierarchical, biological farms with leaderless, horizontal and do-it-yourself activism that she found to be very powerful." Unquote. Monica's political and activist experiences were moving and influential. They helped constitute for her a sense of affinity with the German activists one she, she, which she tried to extend to Portugal. Her political experiences had a profound personal impact, or so I read, and this energized her, this moved her. Those experiences were being moved to different spaces and to different people through her. As Sarah Ahmed points out, emotion comes from the Latin emovere, to move, to move out. And we can see here how they move with us, through us as we also physically move to other spaces. And even positive experiences can be interwoven with negative aspects, presenting as feelings of estrangement. Monica, for instance, comments on how, quote, all the notions about nonviolent communication and communication rules and about conflict de-escalation, for my own shame, her own shame, weren't learned here, meaning in Portugal, unquote. As she both identifies with being Portuguese, but disidentifies with some aspects of what she did not learn here and the cultural constraints around such learnings, there is tension and different belongings are simultaneously mobilized. This tension can also be understood as a wish, a desire that things were different here, that someday someone can learn these skills here, which in turn links back to how she presents as being mobilized by these effects. As Monica moved to Porto, she started to help organize informal meetings there too, along with a person from another group called Paulo Valença. Again, here the interpersonal aspect is very important in different ways. Monica heard about this group that Paulo was part of, called By Portugal, via her personal and political connections to yet another group, the Pink Panthers. Paula told me about how she was connected to activism in the UK, especially in the area of bisexuality. It was also in that milieu that she had, quote, community and activist connections with polyamorous persons, which, unquote, which meant she was, quote, familiar with the poly community in London, unquote, since it overlapped significantly with the bisexual community. Now, the use of this specific word, familiar, with all the implications of emotionality and human connection, gave Paula not only information about something that in Portugal at the time was barely known, but also an affinity that then facilitated the connection with Monica. It does not mean that this was easy or simple. Uh, Monica told me of how in the first meetings, quote, there were a lot of people near our table, you know, in a cafe, pretending to have nothing to do with us, but at the same time trying to see what was going on. It was quite a farcical situation. It's one of those things that annoys about closets and about a certain cowardice that you can find here in Portugal." Unquote. Paula's and Monica's commitment to organize those meetings clashed with other people's fear of what might happen in those meetings, which in turn clashed with Monica's expectations, desires and identifications. The being there but not engaging in conversation the curiosity and the exasperation, all of those things are viewable as political, but they also represent deeply emotional experiences for those involved, full of ambivalence and even perhaps a degree of lack of empathy. To understand all of these decisions requires some knowledge of what it's like to be, in this case, a bisexual or a polyamorous person in Porto, in the Nautis, but also an understanding of how feelings can both mobilize people to come and, at the same time, make them not approach the organizers of the event. Another deeply emotional event, one that would go on to leave a mark upon the entire history of human rights activism in Portugal, happened also in Porto. Gisberta, a transsexual, HIV-positive, migrant, paperless, sex worker woman, was brutally murdered by a group of youngsters. This spurred several groups to create the first Pride March outside of Lisbon, here in Portugal. Paulo Valença characterizes this as a, quote, very organic response, unquote, to Gisberto's murder. 
and that it was more than an LGBT march, as the issues at hand intersected not only trans rights, but also sex work, racism, classism, sexual violence, among others, unlike what happened in Lisbon. And so it became that Poly Portugal, via Monica, became one of the founding groups of the Porto LGBT Pride Parade. But a closer look at the emotional nuances at stake clarify how this happens. According to Monica, Paula Valencia challenged her to attend an organizational meeting, but Monica was, quote, entertained with my poly Portugal, trying to find people to join, and also trying to manage my own poly chaos. So, it can be interpreted that for Monica, this first initiative felt counterintuitive. Her effective energy is already being positively deployed in other ways and having to deal with her own poly chaos. Added to this was Monica's belief that other groups might not acknowledge her or Portal Polyportugal's legitimacy to be there. This represented another turning point for Polyportugal and for polyamory activism in Portugal. Whereas other activities so far have been more about uh, internal community building and forms of what Bacar Dieva calls sub-activism, the co-founding of the Porto Pride March was a movement outwards which was premised on the intersectionality of the Porto March, on the importance of going beyond specific, quote, LGBT issues, unquote, and focusing on the lived experiences of minorities and overlapping systems of oppression. The suddenness, the shock, the grief coming from Gisberto's death served to energize and gather support from left-wing groups who extended their solidarity to the role that Poly Portugal could have in organizing the march. From here on, and even considering the ups and downs this group went through in the last decade, Poly Portugal has never lost this explicitly political edge, one that was facilitated by these very personal and effective connections, and one that represented deep changes for the lives and effects of many afterwards. And so it is clear to me that looking at effects and at the political as personal does not suffice to clearly understand even this small part of Poly Portugal's history, nor it should. In fact, and as I argued in the beginning, what is needed and what I would like to ask from you all here is the curation of archives and a look that intersects activism, sociology, geography, philosophy, and emotionality. As Paula told me, after being shown a, a draft of this speech, this is about, quote, the personal that generates the political, that extends the personal, that becomes political, unquote. To better understand polyamory activism in Portugal, for instance, one needs to look at activist cultures in Germany, in the UK and in other countries, and only then can we start looking at Portugal and start to look at how effects have traveled through and along bodies, how they were put into movement here and there in many different ways. So, in the end, the question is, what do you as researchers, as activists, as activist researchers, as researcher activists, what do you need to understand polyamory and other forms of non-monogamy activism in your countries. Thank you.